tonight's theme is uh, wines for lockdown, uh, but the real title um, is a selection of wines that have a really distinctive flavour of their origin and a bit of a discussion about what that means and what flavour they have that tells you that they're from that origin. And I had a little sneak peek at the wines a few moments ago, and I think they all deliver quite well on their distinctive flavour and um, being quite good for uh, giving a flavour of the origin. Um, not all wine regions do that so well, and um, we'll talk about that in a moment. So tonight we've got Margaret River Chardonnay to kick off. Um, let's talk about Margaret River Chardonnay. So, I mean, I'm sure many of you know already, but uh, I'm just going to show you. We'll better share a screen here, and uh, and uh, so you can just see where we are. So, if I go to uh, just so you can see, uh, you can see that um, obviously there's Perth. And uh, Margaret River's this part way out on the tip of the peninsula. So it's a long, narrow area. It's about three hours drive from Perth, so it's quite a way. And there are various other regions in between. Um, it's got that peninsula has ocean on three sides. So Margaret River famously um, is a cool, mild climate. They never have frosts. It never gets too cold. Um, but it never gets very hot either. And um, originally very famous for Cabernet Sauvignon, but um, Chardonnay has thrived there and makes a very distinctive style. Now, we'll talk about that in a sec, because um, if you, if you uh, were to compare Margaret River to the home of Chardonnay, which is Burgundy in France. Burgundy in France is an inland area and it has extremes of hot and cold, but it's mostly cold. Whereas Margaret River is a mild, cool place. So on the textbook, it's not the same as Burgundy at all. I think that um, one of the things that you could say about Margaret River Chardonnay is that they're very distinctive, but they're unlike Burgundy. And they're unlike Burgundy because Margaret River is a little different to Burgundy. Um, having said that, some of the best bits of Chardonnay are the inland parts, the more easterly bits of Margaret River as you sort of get away from the coast. And uh, that's what makes, um, where the, that's certainly where the vineyards are that make the best, best of them. I've got a more detailed, um, there's, I mean, there's Margaret River itself is very crowded. There's a lot of wineries there and you probably can't really read that on the screen, but obviously if you want to look at Margaret River in detail and all the wineries, you can Google search it yourself and have a bit of a look. But um, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting area. Um, Margaret River was established by enthusiasts from Perth, originally uh, um, doctors back in the 1980s. Um, and also one famous um, Western Australian business entrepreneur who was tied up with mining, a bloke called um, Dennis Horgan. He actually had um, Robert Mondavi from California come out to Australia and consult to him. And Robert Mondavi was struck by the similarity of Margaret River to Napa Valley, where he was from. And he advised that they should plant Cabernet, which is what they did. Um, after some years, a lot of wealthy Western Australian mining magnates got involved in Margaret River. And uh, there's a really interesting marketing PhD paper on Margaret River that shows that Margaret River's fortunes wax and wane entirely connected to the Western Australian mining industry. And so um, when times are good, um, a lot of people want to have that trophy winery in the Margaret River and a lot of people can afford high prices for wine. And of course, if you fetch a high price for wine, you can invest in the best oak, low yields, good winemaking, and you make great wine. And so it goes, it sort of perpetuate your own reputation sort of thing. So the miners certainly moved in and Margaret River has a number of very spectacular uh, wine estates that are owned by wealthy miners. Um, you'd have to say that some of them own it for the reasons of possessing a trophy and um, others are very genuinely interested to do it really, really well. 
you know, Margaret River certainly has come from being a region really that only got going in the 1980s, which is, you know, 40 years ago, um, to becoming a region now that's not only known in Australia, but it's known worldwide. It's some, um, if you go to a tasting of great wines in the UK or New York, there'd probably be a Margaret River wine on the table, which is a pretty good effort, but it certainly uh, shows some of the, um, uh, the you know, the, the, the results of what happens when um, there's a, it was a really big investment. So talking about Margaret River Chardonnay, just not one other quick aside, obviously when you're dealing in really high quality wines and a high price, one of the things that most marketers want to do is to allude to the difference, to, sorry, the similarities, not the differences, the similarities of their wine to its origin. So obviously if you're making great Chardonnay, you'd love to be able to compare your wine to the great wine, the great Chardonnays of Burgundy. And some of you probably know the names. I mean, Chablis is there, but in the main part of Burgundy, you have Merceau and Pouligny Monrachet and a number of other, uh, the Hill of Corton and all these fabulous regions. And so it goes as one of those marketing things that expensive wines, and in the case of Chardonnay, um, there'll be comparisons. One of the things that, um, <clears throat> you know, I wouldn't say too publicly at one of those tastings is that Margaret River of Chardonnay is delightful, but it's not like Burgundy. <laughs> um, and it, 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 Margaret River Chardonnay, what characterizes is the fact that Margaret River Chardonnays are rich and juicy and they get this honeyed, like very ripe, <clears throat> ripe white peach honeyed flavor. So to this wine we have in front of us, if you stick your nose in that, it's got, <clears throat> it's almost got the vanillin panna cotta honey dessert sweetness about it. You know, there's a real um, um, a very um, vanillin, it's almost custody sweetness. And um, on the palate, it's got a very um, uh, round, rich, um, little bit viscous, um, very soft, uh, very generous. It doesn't have any of that steely, grainy complexity that you get on Burgundy or the Adelaide Hills or Yarra Valley or some of Australia's really cold inland parts. One of the things that the Margaret River producers um, started doing a lot with their Chardonnay and they've eased back, of course, is to use a fair bit of oak barrel treatment. Now, the overt actual oak flavour that you might see has been wound back. But if you have fairly ripe grapes and you have um, the ability to put the fermenting wine into the barrels, and when the fermentation's over, all the yeast drops out as a very fine sediment called lees, and you coat the barrel, you can pick up these really soft flavours um, in your Chardonnay from the right type of oak barrels. They're normally quite expensive. And one of the oak barrel flavours that you see if you do that, and particularly in Margaret River you see it, is a nuttiness. And one of the classic descriptors of um, Margaret River Chardonnay is that behind that white peach and a bit of grapefruity um, uh, creme brulee richness, you get this cashew nut note. And if you stick your nose in this wine, you can smell a bit of the hazelnuts, cashew nut sweetness. There's a nutty sweetness on the wine behind all that. And it's very appealing. It's a complex wine. It's rich, it's soft, it's full bodied, it's easy to drink. Um, it, it doesn't have that steely acidity that you um, that is associated often with Chablis and um, um, Burgundy and um, cool parts of Australia. And when you see those expressive, full flavoured, peachy, cashew nut Chardonnays, pretty much the only region I know that does it is Margaret River. So that's why it's a very expressive wine. Whenever you get this kind of wine uh, in the lineup, um, you can usually, um, usually see. Now, if you get round to trying Lewin Estate, the one I mentioned earlier, Lewin Estate's even more cashew nut than this. They've toned it back a bit in recent years and they changed winemaker about three years ago and there was a bit of debate about that. But um, 
if you if you if you get the Lewin estate is a very expensive one, and um, uh, so um, you know they're not the easy to find. I mean, Lewin estate on new release now um, they're sort of ninety ninety dollars a bottle, and if you get um, Lewin estate wines of four and five and six years age that show that very um, intense cashew nut nuttiness. The wines can be 120, 130, 140 dollars a bottle, which is a lot. And but they have this amazing, um, really obvious, really intense cashew nut sweetness on the aroma, and it's it's very distinctive, and it's it's very much the Lewin Estate style. But to a certain extent, a lot of the um, Margaret River producers um, have they share that 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 same characteristic. And to me, it's a Margaret River flavour. It's because the um, Chardonnay is actually a great variety that's very flexible. It grows in a whole variety um, um, of climates. Um, Chardonnay ripens pretty easy, no matter what uh, climate conditions you tend to have. And um, it, it certainly does a good job in Margaret River for producing this style. So there's our first wine, trying in a lockdown, envisage yourself in Margaret River. Um, yes, in winter it gets cool, but not that cold. They, they never have frosts unknown because of that um, proximity to the ocean. Um, a very interesting place to visit. Um, I mean, you can catch a bus, but most people go to Margaret River, go down for a few days and they hire a car in Perth and they drive down. And um, you can certainly um, have a good look around that corner of, per uh, of Western Australia. Uh, when we're all allowed to travel again, whenever that may be. So it's an interesting one. Any questions about uh, Margaret River or the Chardonnay or comments or anything like that, please um, please fire away. Andrew, I've got one that's called Willie Abrupt Valley. Is that the same one? Yeah, Willie Abrupt is um, a sub-region in Margaret River. It's one of the really good bits. It's one of the very originally settled parts of Margaret River and there's quite a few of the really famous producers there. That um, detailed map I had up a moment ago shows the little Williabra sub-district. So um, the brand of the wine you've got, so um, my is, mine's Woodlands Estate and it says yeah. Williabra on it. So uh, there um, but is this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, it's very nice. Very, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's um. Um, so if you were if you're going to sort of summarize on what makes Margaret River Chardonnay distinct, the answer is um, that they have this full, rich, soft, nutty, generous peachy flavor. And um, it's a very agreeable taste. I think it's more an evening wine with complex food. It's not necessarily wine you want to drink on a hot day for lunch because there's a certain peachy richness about the wines. The, the creme brulee um, sweetness on the aroma is, um, you do get a touch of that in other regions, but it's very much part and parcel of the Margaret River style. Um, creme brulee is actually a, by, a byproduct of uh, extensive uh, lees aging. Um, and to get it, you've got to keep the lees alive a bit. So that means that um, the wine gets a fair bit of time in oak barrels and um, they roll the barrels around actually so that the um, barrel, the inside of the barrel is coated with all the lee sediment. And um, one of the interesting things that happens is that um, the, the, the coating of lees on the inside of the barrel acts as a sort of a little membrane and um, it lets the uh, sweet, nutty, um, components of the oak into the wine and not the harsh components. And um, one of the main ingredients of oak barrels that comes into um, all um, alcohol, actually, it, it's, it is a family of compounds called lactones. And lactone is what's giving you that creme brulee. Lactone is what you get in custard and caramel and stuff like that. So there's this um, very interesting flavour. So that's the story on uh, Margaret River Chardonnay. I think they have a distinctive flavour. They pop up, and even in a lineup, you do see them, and um, they're um, interesting. David, you got a question? Yeah, Andrew. Just in regard to um, the types of barrels they're using, is there a preference in Margaret River to the use of American oak over French oak? 
because they do but, have, you know, when I think of Fasse Felix or Voyager, they have that very strong vanilla overtones in there. Yeah. So um, in these wines, all French oak, um, probably really good, very expensive. To get that nuttiness, um, the what's been worked out over the years is it's a particular forest of oak in France. Um, for your interest, it's the Limousin Forest, which is one of the um, uh, particular origins of, um, of oak that you can buy. And if you get, you know, when you manufacture a barrel, you've got to heat the staves and you can heat it with steam or fire or whatever method you want. And you can actually um, uh, have a barrel that's produced by uh, charry heat and you can specify that. And that gives a certain flavour to, uh, to wine. But you can actually specify a barrel that's got low char or no char. So it's the stays have been bent by steam. And so low char or no char limousin oak is what gives you the cashew nut on Margaret River Chardonnay. And that's what they all do. So Vas Felix, Lewin Estate, um, Voyager, uh, Piero, uh, um, Cullens, are all using that regime, pretty much. That's that's what they do. With the reds, they would change to um, probably a, mix, a, a combination of oak. The old French oak, again, they probably wouldn't use much limousin oak on the reds. They'd be going for Vosges, Nevers, and the other famous forests um, for their style. There's a lot more um, diversity of flavour when you come to Margaret River reds and in particularly they're famous for Cabernet and that's a subject for another time but in terms of um, Margaret River Chardonnay there's a tendency for the wine we have in front of us ah there's one proviso um, we're dealing in upmarket Chardonnay here this is this is um, reasonably expensive anything with lovely oak and lees and you know lovely peachy richness is is up there in price um, there are some uh, lower price Margaret River wines and of course it's a it's a fairly big region that's why this one says willy abrupt being the heart of the area and uh that's that's a certain charm but you can get some lower price margaret river chardonnay and that won't really exhibit what we're talking about tonight but i'm sort of not suggesting that you try them as being typical what we have tonight is some premium quality margaret river chardonnay and i think it's got a, 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 a distinctive flavor so if you're in lockdown like uh michael and uh <laughs> Anna Law and <laughs> Frederick and gang. If you're in lockdown, just imagine you're in this district and uh, um, it's a very mild night and you're sitting back and sipping uh, Margaret River Chardonnay. <laughs> probably if you're in lockdown in Sydney, you've been locked down for weeks, you're probably sipping it pretty quickly by now, if not glugging it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Six weeks, there we go. Seven. Seven. Yeah, seven weeks. Wow, a lot, a lot of trips to Dan Murphy. A lot of trips to Dan Murphy. I know. Yep, yep. Well, we're in September. We're going to do another one of these wines that speak to their origin, and we're going to do another Australian classics region. So, um, actually, I think it might have um, Laura might have put it on the email today. The themes for September, but if you are interested if you have a look at the website later this week it should all be there and uh that seems a good topic we should we might move along um unless some, anybody's got a question about margaret river or chardonnay um and we'll move along to um a barossa valley wine um of course a little bit like um a little bit like the uh um talking a moment ago, there are uh, um, qualifications and things you have to say. So um, here's a map of South Australia. I think anybody with an interest in wine probably knows a little bit about this. So um, obviously you have um, Adelaide on the coast and then you um, go um, pretty much uh, north and slightly east to get to the Barossa Valley and you can see the Barossa there. You have the Adelaide Hills and McLaren Vale. Yes, and uh, Clare Chance. Valley further north. Well, we're know. talking, we're talking the Barossa Valley. Open so that, um, okay. You can see where it is. No, 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 no. Now, if you um, we'll sweat the GSM. if you go well, to the uh, subregions, <laughs> no. um, okay. 
This is one of the things about um, about the Brossa Valley that's, um, I guess, not appreciated as well as it could be. But the Brossa Valley, you know, really famous area. I mean, um, I suppose if you were looking at a tasting of representative Australian wines in London or New York, and there had to be, you know, one Australian wine with other wines of the world or something. A lot of people would say that the classic representative wine of Australia traditionally has been the rich, ripe, American oaked uh, Barossa Valley Shiraz. Um, and certainly the likes of um, Penfolds and Wolf Blas have made that style very famously for a long time. One of the things, of course, I'm sure everyone knows is that um, Penfolds and Wolf Blas um, blend every year. They're looking for a consistency. And the wine's not necessarily always um, Barossa Valley. They, um, Penfolds are famous for sourcing for Grange from elsewhere. Um, they have certainly have some wine that's um, just from um, the Barossa Valley, but um, it varies a bit. Certainly uh, Penfolds and Wolf Blas are interested in a really consistent style and they change their winemaking from year to year to suit, and they do use a lot of oak. And there's been a bit of a reaction against that by a lot of Barossa Valley winemakers who would rather that the character of the Barossa emerges, not the character of very ripe grapes with a fair bit of skillful oak. I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Penfolds or Wolf Blast style, they're really um, well-known wines. but but the flavour that you see tends to be a rich, forward, generous, ripe and reasonably high alcohol style with a lot of oak character. And as the wines age, they take on this liqueur, this liqueur, sort of chocolate liqueur, berry liqueur style, which a lot of people really like. There's another style of the Brossa that's not that, and um, younger winemakers in particular are uh, promoting it. They call themselves the artisans of the Barossa, and you can look at their website. And they've done this study, along with um, others, on different soil types and different subregions in the Barossa. And here's this map on the screen. You can see the red bit, which is the western part. That's, you know, Sepulsfield and Gomasol and um, over towards Marananga is much hotter than the northern bit. And, of course, especially the Eden Valley bit, which is up on the hills, it's the Eden Valley is up about 400 metres of altitude and, and it's about 300 metres higher than the floor of the Barossa Valley. And it's a pretty short distance um, to drive from the towns in the centre of the Barossa here uh, up to Eden Valley is only about a 15 minute drive. And uh, you go up in the hills and the climate changes quite a lot. So the Barossa Valley itself has got a lot of interesting diverse subregions producing different grapes. This particular wine we're about to try is from um, the sort of middle northern part here around this sort of uh, um, the, the north of that sort of Tanunda, the main um, Barossa Plains, the northern plains. So from a reasonably warm area, but just slightly on the um, eastern slopes. You know, while I leave that map up there, to the wine. So it's um, mostly Grenache, but a fair bit of Shiraz in it as well. And the first thing you note when you stick your nose in it, it's got quite a strong, rich blueberries, blueberries aroma, which is a, which is a ripe Shiraz fruit thing, provided the wine's not masked with too much oak. So it does have quite a blueberries flavour. And then on the palate, it's got a silkiness. And you'll notice that the back of the palate's quite soft. Now, if you want to do the um, experiment yourself, you can put a wine like that with a reasonably traditional Penfolds or Wolf Blast or um, one of the other um, traditional Barossa winemakers, and you'll discover that the, there's a difference in the shape in the mouth. Because if you're using a lot of oak, you get a lot of perfume from the oak, 
but you do get a back of the palate firmness as well from the oak tannin, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that it's a different style. So this new artisans of the Barossa, and there's another subgroup called the Young Guns of the Barossa, they are easing back, in fact, easing back very quickly on the use of oak barrels. They, they store the wine in oak, but they don't want the oak to have too much flavour. What they're trying to show is this um, blueberries, raspberry, you get a bit of raspberry, but mainly it's a blueberries thing. Um, and the wines are picked not too ripe and not so they don't form too much alcohol. So this particular wine tastes to me like it's about 13 and a half when you're looking to the alcohol strength. I'm going to be there somewhere. Um, Oh, it's 14 and a half. So it's actually a bigger alcohol than what I think it tastes like. Um, but it's certainly got that silky blueberries character. Now, to me, uh, blueberry aroma, rich blueberries, is a Barossa thing. And that's what Barossa Shiraz does. Um, there's this same movement going in McCurran Vale. And they have, they don't have this rich blueberries. They have something different more red fruits and they get a kind of a earthy raspberry character, which in itself is very interesting. But um, So in terms of what is the classical flavour that is being beamed into your home in lockdown from the far off Barossa Valley, provided we're dealing with one of the new guard of uh, making Barossa Valley Shiraz, and this in this case a Grenache Shiraz blend, um, you're looking for that blueberries aroma. That's the really the big thing. And then a very silky mid palate. And after you swallow, and you can taste the wine for some time, it's got some really nice persistence. The feel of the wine is sort of towards the front of your mouth. And there isn't that back of the palate dryness that you will get off the more traditional, older style Barossa Valley winemaking. Penfolds would be mortified if they knew I was calling them old fashioned. But anyway, we've got, I'm just picking up a term here. So um, there's a wine that I think, um, because of its blueberry aroma, blueberry aroma, rich mid palate, and essentially a soft finish, is I can't think of a district that anywhere in the world that makes a wine that's got that combination of flavour. By the way, I think this is really delicious. I really like the Grenache. I think it's lightening the wine up and it's some a very drinkable wine for 14.5%. Um, Grenache has made a bit of a comeback in the Barossa Valley. And again, the young guns and artisans are the ones that are pursuing the Grenache thing. Um, this is John Duval, who um, was at one time the, um, the Penfolds Grange winemaker, who um, left well, a long time ago, 20 years ago, I guess he left Penfolds and establish his own brand, but he's in a group of the artisans of the Brossa that all make 100% uh, Grenache wines as well. And they've got a bit of a cult following going. They don't make much of it and they're quite expensive. And every now and then you see a pack of Barossa Grenaches from the artisans of the Barossa movement and you can buy the mixed pack of Grenache. Um, if you're interested, just have a look at their website. They've got a whole website called the Artisans of the Barossa and you'll see their main headliner is um, um, is pushing the is pushing their Grenache project. That's a good question. Um, to me, I, it's got a lot of Shiraz in it, Amy. I'm just having a quick look and see if the back label tells you anything about that, which it doesn't. To me, even though they've got well, you know, the 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 um, the convention is that you put the um, name first that is the majority in the blend. So this is, a, I see he's labelled this Shiraz Grenache Mavedra. So that would indicate that the Shiraz is the a majority of the blend. Um, he doesn't exactly say how much, but to me it tastes like there's, um, that the Shiraz is definitely the main part of that wine. Um, that blueberries, that really rich blueberries intensity is a Shiraz thing. Um, if you get straight Grenache, you tend to get red fruits, particularly red currant, which that wine doesn't really show. That shows that really aromatic blueberries, which is um, very nice. Anybody got a question about that or um, 
Barossa Valley in general? Or yeah, um, I'm just curious. Um, you know, an SMG, no SGM, as opposed to an a, I was going to say MSG. Anyway, wrong thing. A GSM. Is there a reason? You know, maybe the climate of that particular vintage was one where Shiraz was shining more than Grenache. Um, I think 2019 was a pretty good year. It was a reasonably cool year actually in South Australia. So probably the Shiraz was a you know fresh style. So he probably felt he could use a fair bit of it. So I think he'd just make a blending decision um, at the time. Um, yes, and th the wine I have is 2019. So someone just pop popped up there on the chat um, what, what, um, the, uh, uh, what the percentages are. But um, so, um, yeah, 45 Shiraz. Shiraz tends to be a pretty you know, powerful component. And so um, I think here the um, the Grenache is a sort of a freshening um, component to the wine. I think it's pretty good. Um, one thing I find that is um, uh, is the GSMs and SGMs and SMGs, whatever you know. You, like I said, the majority grape is put at the beginning. Uh, they don't have the popularity, you know. I judge in quite a few wine shows and. You know, typically you might do the Shiraz class and then that afternoon you'll do the Shiraz blend class, which will be the GSMs and SMGs and stuff. And the blended Shiraz Grenaches are every bit as good later on when you investigate. Even though the same winemaking effort and the same quality is taking place, invariably the Shiraz blends are cheaper. In the marketplace, you'll if you get, you know, certain winemaker Shiraz, it'll be a certain price. If you get same winemaker GSM or SGM, it's it's cheaper, invariably cheap. So um, I reckon add Shiraz blends to your arsenal of wine to be interested in because I think they're great. I I might like them myself, and uh, um, and look out for that young guns of the Barossa, the artisans of the Barossa, that sort of style. And next time you get a Barossa wine, make sure you can smell the, the blueberries, the berries flavor, which is straight off. When you walk into the winery in a, where they're crushing, you know, right, well warm climate, ripened Shiraz, you can smell the, the blueberries. You can smell this intense blueberries aroma. Um, and you know what is being crushed without having to go and ask. In a cooler climate winery, the, even though the grapes are ripe, they have a different character. So cool climate winery, you get this um, slightly spicy, more red raspberry, red cherry aroma, and that's a different aroma. And so um, you get a different thing. But here we're talking about Barossa Shiraz, and um, I think that blueberries aroma is great. And um, it's there even though it's a blend, so it's um, something to look out for. Any other questions or queries about Brossa Valley or the or Shiraz blend or anything like that? So Andrew, what, what, what's the typical mix of percentages of the three different grape grapes in a GSM? Is there a typical mix or yeah, is it all um, different? Yeah, GSM itself um, would typically be probably somewhere around the 40% Grenache and then probably 30% Shiraz and maybe 30% Mavedra. Right. But it varies a bit. Um, yeah. The SGM would be very similar, but flipped around. I guess um, the Shiraz is giving the aroma and the mid palate richness. The Grenache gives you the a little bit of lightness and a bit of lift, a bit of lift to the aroma. Shiraz can get a bit heavy, particularly if it's really mm. bright. So. Yeah. Uh, they're good bedfellows, I reckon, and Grenache and Shiraz. The, uh, in the southern part of the Rhone Valley, the French have been blending Grenache and Shiraz. They call it Syrah, of course. They've been, um, they've been blending there for centuries. And uh, Chateau Neuf du Pape is one of the most famous wines in the world, which is dominated by Grenache, but it also has quite a bit of Shiraz in it. And uh, in Australia, I think, um, you know, we could do more with the image of blend, blends of Shiraz and Grenache. And like I said, at the moment, it's considered a bit of a poor cousin. Um, 
And in answer to your question, um, Amy, about the popularity, um, it's reasonably well known out there that Grenache and Shiraz Grenache blends are not especially popular. They mainly sell on the South Australian market. They're not considered very trendy. Um, Grenache is seen as a bit of a workhorse variety. It can make some pretty uninteresting wine. I mean, Grenache is a bit like Merlot. If you overcrop it and don't allow it to develop some intensity, you can get pretty ordinary wine out of it. Whereas Shiraz that's from, you know, ordinary to okay vineyards made in an ordinary to okay way oh, still oh, makes oh, reasonable oh, sort of wine. That's not the case with um, Grenache and Merlot. Um, they, um, if you do all the, make all the trouble, keep the yields down, um, have it done from the vineyard and then um, make it a you know, clever sort of wine. Uh, the, um, you can get you know, great intensity and that's what's so good about it. Um, yeah, can we come over to your place for dinner? I just saw that comment. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> Probably all uh, all all locked into what we can do for dinner and things. Phil um, keeps saying Phil keeps saying to me, Andrew. He says, "Give me a recipe and I will make it." So okay. I said, "Okay, great lemon lemon potatoes." It is. Uh, sounds good. Well, uh, before we finish tonight, of course, we'll have um, Ken's wine of the week. And we'll have Frederick's uh, recipe of the week, so we'll all be. He'll have to have your pad and pen ready, and we'll have a look at what um, he's going to recommend. He's probably got something ready to go, just precisely with these wines. But we'll get there shortly. Let's um, let's go along to our Heathcote, our Heathcote Shiraz. Now I shall just uh, share my screen again, and um, we'll have a look at the. Um, Heathcote area. There's um, the map of um, map of Victoria, and um, the Heathcote um, uh, area is uh, sort of stuck here. Small area, so I've got the mouse pointing out of out at it at the moment. Um, so it's east of Bendigo, and it's sort of on the bit of the Great Dividing Range that wraps around, although. It, it leans, the natural inclination is a slope sort of northwards towards the Murray River. But it's a reasonably cold part of Victoria. Having said that, it gets pretty hot in summer. Um, it's like so many parts of Victoria that it made fantastic wine in the 1850s, 60s, 70s and 80s to the 1890s. And in that time, Victoria was became a very wealthy part of the world because of the gold mining and because of the wine, the wine and the various things followed the gold miners. And I'm not sure everybody with their Australian history knows about Ballarat and Bendigo and various other parts of Victoria for the gold mining. When you get further north from Heathcote, you sort of come to um, the Murray Valley areas, and there's uh, Rutherglen and other parts, they're much hotter uh, and they do different styles. A little south of Heathcote, you'll see the Macedon Ranges, which is um, interestingly for this, you may not know, but Australia's coldest wine region is Macedon. It's colder than Tasmania. That's because Macedon faces the south, there's no protection between it and the Southern Ocean and the cold wind whips off the Southern Ocean and blows through this godforsaken part of Victoria here in the cold weather, and Macedon cops it. So Macedon's pretty famous for people that are um, growing Pinot Noir and growing grapes to make premium sparkling wine. So just a little to the north of Macedon is the Heathcote area. And Heathcote has history where grapes are grown and Great wine was made in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, as I mentioned. One of the issues that occurred was that by the 1880s and 1890s, the phylloxera pest had got into Victoria, and a lot of Victoria's areas were decimated by phylloxera, and it cost a lot of money to replant on the 
resistant American rootstocks. And then in the 1890s, there was a big bank bust and a worldwide recession. And the demand for Australian wine being exported to England dried up in the 1890s. And a lot of parts of Victoria under that dual onslaught turned their areas of grapes and grape growing over to, well, sheep, essentially. Um, sheep took over and <clears throat> that was how it was for a long time. In the 1970s and 1980s, a new pioneer breed came along and started rediscovering and redeveloping these once very famous wine parts of Victoria. Now, initially the ones that did it, did the areas really quite close to Melbourne. So um, the Mornington Peninsula, the Arrow Valley led the charge and then the Geelong region. And then later on East Gippsland, which is this part here. Of course, all those areas were easy driving distance from Melbourne. And so Melbourneites could drive out to a cellar door in under an hour. And that really put a lot of those regions on the map in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, James Halliday, who was writing the national column for the Weekend Australian, moved to the Arrow Valley back then. And he certainly helped things along because he wrote incessantly and still does about the um, interesting boutique parts of Victoria. Um, Heathcote had the history, but was later to be reinvented. I guess the pioneer was uh, Jasper Hill. And Jasper Hill's a really famous brand that you see around, very nice wines, very intense, very expensive. Um, but it's the main leader in the Heathcote area. So that's the region there. It's, it's a very interesting part of the world. Jasper Hill, I suppose, started making the area famous in the late, mid, late 1990s. So the rejuvenation of Heathcote's probably 20 years old. So it's not that old. Um, now, the interesting thing about Heathcote is that it developed early on a quite distinctive flavour for Shiraz. And to this day, Shiraz is what dominates the Heathcote area. And the style they have is different to a lot of other very traditional Australian Shiraz. So I have a Heathcote Shiraz, let's go. When you stick your nose in this one, this is more the red berries, red fruits. It smells a bit like red raspberries. It's not unlike a Pinot Noir. It has black cherry and red cherry on it. And if you go back, back to the um, Barossa wine, it's more blueberries. This one's the, like I said, the red rich cherry. On the palate, it's got a slightly savoury tartness, not as, not as tart as some of the ones that I've seen, but there's that slight sourness from high acidity because heat is a reasonably cold area. So the grapes ripen with more acidity and that transitions through to a, that degree of savoury character about it. It has a different shape. It actually has a long, thin kind of flavour. So after you swallow it, you can feel the shape in the mouth. And if you go back, backwards and forwards between the two wines, when you come back to the Barossa wine, there's a really generous, ripe, rich blueberries. And on the palate, a rich, full middle of the palate, round juiciness, very concentrated in the middle of your, of your palate. When you go to the Heathcote Shiraz, it's more the Red, red fruits, the red cherry, and one of the interesting flavours you get on Heathcote is there's a certain um, herb complexity. The main common herb you get is a touch of sage. You get this provincial sage herb, Boku Garni aroma. And this wine here, imagine walking out a hot day in Provence or the Granite Bell or an inland Australian garden where you have rosemary and sage and interesting herbs and there's bees buzzing and you can smell the sort of the air with all these interesting herbal aromas and there's a touch of that on this wine and that's that last attribute 
along with the red cherry aroma, is what made Heathcote famous. Because Heathcote Shirazes can often be very alcoholic. Jasper Hill's famous for being sort of 15 and a half, 16 percent. This one here, uh, 14 point. Uh, 14 percent it says so um, it's not as high as what they can be but Heathcote Shiraz can be very ripe very alcoholic yet display this red cherry and sage and have a slightly savory palate complexity you're very good with the Greek lamb lemon potatoes and whatever else was in there so um let's sort of think about Heathcote Shiraz it's sort of come along as being a counterpoint, something really intense, having a lot of flavour, a lot of character, very recognisable, but quite different to South Australian Shiraz. And uh, oak is not a part of the wine. Um, Heathcote Shiraz is not unlike Pinot Noir, although it's got a more blocky, um, simplistic uh, taste profile. It doesn't have that velvet thing that Pinot Noir gets, but nonetheless, very distinctive. And so Heathcote's got itself on the map and, um, and uh, um, I think I, I like Heathcote Shiraz myself. I um, like that um, red cherry savoury thing. If you move from Heathcote um, back south a little to the west and you go through the Grampians area and eventually you come to Great Western, there, instead of getting sage, you start to get a black pepper uh, complexity on the Shiraz. It's quite different, even though it's only um, you know, 100 kilometres of travel. That's one of the really interesting things about some about traveling in Victoria. A short distance can actually make quite a big difference to the taste of the wines. And that sort of central Victorian area, I find uh, fascinating as a wine tourist. So um, there's a Heathcote Shiraz. Um, to me, I um, you do see red cherry and sage savory acidity Shiraz from other regions. The main region to bear in mind is um, St. Joseph uh, and to a certain extent Hermitage, which is the two areas in the central northern Rhone Valley. They tend to have a, particularly St. Joseph tends to pick up the flavour. St. Joseph though is lower alcohol, whereas um, Heathcote can get quite big and juicy and rich. And they're quite powerful wines. So there's one producer early on, as well as Jasper Hill, called Wild Duck Creek. And they made a very concentrated Shiraz, which they called Duck Muck, which some of you have probably heard about. And in the early days when the American critic Robert Parker was discovering Australian wine, now Robert Parker loves huge high alcohol, big dense reds. And um, very early on, uh, and we're talking now the mid 1990s, Robert Parker gave Duck Muck really high scores. And immediately all the Americans wanted it. He gave Duck Muck, you know, 98 points out of 100. And if you ever see it around, um, I mean, there's the Wild Duck Creek straight Shiraz, which is also very expensive. Um, they're really big. They're 16% massive, big concentrated reds, but they still keep this red cherry and sage thing going. Um, Jasper Hill's famous, there are a number of other producers. You do get a touch of the red cherry and sage in some of the other Australian inland higher altitude places. So a touch of it in the Grampians. Um, you get a little bit, in, little bit of it in the northern parts of southern Western Australia, a little bit around Orange in New South Wales, and the granite belt in Queensland has um, gets a red cherry sage um, savoury style on its Shiraz as well. In fact, the the granite belt of Queensland is not dissimilar to Heathcote in some ways. I mean, the granite belt's a lot higher, but obviously it's much further north as well. So I guess that. Is what you'd need. Anyway, there's some um, Heathcote Shiraz, and when you look across some of the Heathcote Shirazes, they all tend to have that interesting red cherry sage, and then a, a long, and they can get quite savoury, even though they're very um, rich and alcoholic all at the same time. 
And I really can't think of other regions anywhere really that do it quite like that. So in terms of being cooped up at home and thinking of some far off wine region, um, there's three wines for you tonight. Um, now, anybody got a question or comment or want to talk about Heathcote or other regions of Victoria or these different tastes of Shiraz? Um, Andrew, I was just doing a little count up there on your map. It, there's 21 different regions in Victoria, is that right? That'd probably be right, yeah. yeah. They've all got geographical indications, the official GI designation too, yeah. yeah. So, so when you think about Australia being having 76 regions, have a 21 in one state, small state, yeah. a bit significant. It is. So, in fact, Victorians pride themselves on that. And um, uh, the other thing about Victoria is that a short distance takes you to quite a different region. And which they like, whereas South Australia, the distances are really big. And you tend to get a quite a consistency of style across the South Australian region, even though you're moving from one end to the other, which can be quite a big distance. Now, I showed that map of the Barossa Valley before with the different sub-regions and the different soil types and the different climates. Yes, and there are distinct different flavours from, say, the north in the Kalimna area of the Barossa Valley down to the southern, um, you know, Filsal uh, area to the west, to the east. But there's a certain style you do see across the Barossa Valley. Um, I mean, the famous there's two famous producers up in the Eden Valley, obviously Yalumba and Henschke. And uh, even though they're higher altitude and quite a ways away from the floor of the Barossa Valley, those two producers still produce that blueberries, silky richness on their Shiraz. So there's a sort of a consistency about the Barossa Valley. There's a consistency of Coonawarra. There's a consistency of McLaren Vale. But, but in Victoria, short distance and things change a lot. In fact, in Heathcote itself, there's actually a bit of a difference between the southern bit and the northern bit, which I'll tell you all about if you ever go there. Um, the southern bit's got the really ancient soils, these Cambrian soils that are the oldest wine region soils in the world. And it's a pretty arid area but these really old soils hold the water really well. So if it hasn't rained for a year or so, there's nonetheless still moisture down there and the, the vines can find it and, and so on. So very interesting. Um, yeah, but you're right, Victoria's lots of regions and really complex and really diverse. Very interesting wine state. Great for tourism if you feel like a tour. <laughs> COVID permitting one of these times. <laughs> Anybody else want to ask a question or make a comment about the wines? We might go to um, to uh, Ken. Are you ready with a, a, a bargain wine of the week for us um, this week, please? I think I've got a suggestion, Andrew, yes. <laughs> but for those of you who don't know, I try to pick something which people can obtain because it's easy to make recommendations that are rather difficult to actually obtain. And Coriol, um, I, I've been exploring one or two of their alternative varieties in this last year or two. I think they're getting better and better and better. And their Sangiovese and their Barbera. I opened a bottle of the 2020 Barbera, I'm pretty sure it was, so it'll be still available. And I thought their 2020 Barbera was a delightful alternative variety. And of course, if you uh, have a look at the Coriol website itself, the great advantage is they've got quite a lot of uh, different odd varieties. They've got some Fiano and they've got this and that and a couple of other odd things. So you can buy a little bit of a mixed case with a couple of this and a couple of that. Uh, and of course, also olive oil and cheese at the same time. How good does it get? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, righto. Frederick, we need uh, just the right um, um, French, Belgian influenced um, uh, dish tonight now for the uh, for, uh, for for the wines we've had tonight. <laughs> okay, um, it, it's it is a, a, the the third wine or last wine that sort of gave the inspiration because the the savory and the red cherry. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to try to sell a, a, a classic Belgian dish to you. Um, and it's not something that they will serve to you in any sort of Michelin restaurant. It's more sort of a comfort food. It is a meatball recipe. And it, it's, uh, it, it's not about the meatballs, it's about the sauce. It's a sort of a, a savory gravy, but it comes with uh, red cherries. And it's uh, and so Liège is a sort of a, the sanguine sort of a southern capital of Belgium, um, and we would drive two hours through three hours just to get that dish right. It is it's quite exclusive. You you can't get it anywhere else in the world, and it's sort of a meatball dish. But this sort of combination of red cherries and a gravy sauce would go very well with with the last wine. Um, it, it's quite unique. I haven't tried it with the combination, and people would often drink it with a, actually a red cherry beer. But I think that would go very well. I think um, that would be an excellent combination. Patrick, how do you spell Liege? Liege is a L I E G E. I, I'll put it. I'll put a. I'll put a link. Yeah. Any accents? Okay, you you write it, and we can. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get to I'll get Frederick to uh, send the recipe in and we'll post it. So you'll be able to <laughs> yeah, in a few more days. You'll be able to get a bottle of wine to go. So <laughs> no, I'm sure you'll be able to. We'll we'll, we'll get the recipe. And make sure it's um, on the website. So we'll match it up to the uh, to the Heathcote wines. So that'll that'll be great. Um, next week, folks, um, we're doing a tour of lesser known regions down the Great Dividing Range. Um, this is also uh, a, a topic of um, some interest. Um, I've, um, when I was in day, uh, years gone by, I was doing some corporate consulting and um, had a lot to do with one of the big uh, companies in South Australia, um, namely Orlando. And um, they were like so many that um, were, you know, either publicly owned or they were privately owned, but they're a very large company. And in the, for decades, they'd appreciated the fact that um, one of the things about growing grapes and making wine is that you can have regions that are unpredictable in their weather patterns and you get bad vintages. Now, to a certain extent, South Australia doesn't have bad vintages. It gets colder, they get not much rain. Rain is the big problem, obviously, towards harvest. If the, if the grapes get wet and the rain hangs around and there's a lot of humidity in the vineyard, the rots break out. You've got to spray. It's a real problem. So um, if you're essentially growing grapes in a flat, arid area, now, if you've got water and there's a time where the grapes need a little drink and you can put a little bit of irrigation on them, that gives you the best of everything you'd want. And that's sort of been the formula for South Australia for um, decades and decades and decades. As I'm sure everybody tonight knows, one of the bit of a problems with that um, safe feeling is the fact that the uh, other states of Australia are starting to restrict how much water they let flow down the Murray over the Victorian border into South Australia. And suddenly there's not so much water that might well be available for this because there's a massive pipeline from the Murray yeah. Valley across to the yeah. Barossa Valley oh, well, yeah. to irrigate the area. Yeah. So things have changed. But certainly um, some people say that the, um, uh, the there's a f huge difference between the very predictable, safe, wine making, grape growing wine making of South Australia and along the rivers area, so along the Murrumbidgee and the Murray, to the interesting bits and pieces that you see down the Great Dividing Range. And when you think about it, we've got a lot of small, pretty interesting areas. I mean, obviously it starts in the granite belt in Queensland, but then you have New England and then Orange, Mudgee, further on to Cowra, Canberra, uh, Tumbarumba, the hilltops area. Across the border then you have East Gippsland and then there's the parts then around, um, so um, uh, uh, the um, Ballarat, Bendigo, Grampians are all Great Dividing Range areas, which means they're on these fairly steep mountain ranges and they get the 
different aspects to the sun and so on. So next week's theme is to go to some unknown bits of the Great Dividing Range. And um, um, that's, that's our theme. We might do that again because there's some pretty good wine coming from those areas now when you consider how many of those um, areas there are. Orange is, I think, particularly interesting, spectacular area. Um, there's Canberra and the hilltops just west of Canberra. And that includes Tumbarumba, which is some, you know, finding a lot of um, fortune at the moment. That's next week's theme. Um, I've set the themes for um, September, and we're going to do a, um, a, a another look at Australian classic regions, three more classic regions and what makes them classic. And we're going to do another lockdown theme like tonight, where I'm going to um, put three more wines on that are very distinctive of their area and explain what it is about them that tells you they're from that particular area. And hopefully, if you can recognise those flavours and, you know, memorise that, you'll run into those wines somewhere in the future and you'll be able to sniff and sip the wine and say, wow, I think this wine is from Heathcote or whatever it might be. Or another conversation piece you've got tonight is you can say, I know this wine you've given me is from the Barossa Valley. It's very liqueur chocolatey which is obviously an oak component. Now, it's a very delicious full-bodied wine, but, of course, it's not that expressive of being from the Barossa Valley. It's more expressive of being a blended wine with a lot of oak from South Australia, which is not a bad thing. That's just what, you know, Penfolds and Wolf Blast and Orlando and a lot of other companies do exceedingly well. But there's a very big new interest in what defines wine that's got a great typicity of the Barossa Valley. And tonight I thought that very bell clear blueberries and very soft finish did it really, really well. Um, so anyway, that's something for you to look at next time. So, right, gang, lovely to catch up with everybody. Anita, how's the, you've, you've um, dialed in. It's lovely to see you after a bit of time. You, uh, how's the, um, how are the travels up the coast going? Yeah, I didn't expect to be home tonight, so it was um, lucky that we were and glad I joined in, but um, renovations are going, yes. Between lockdowns, they're oh. still going. <laughs> That's right. We've got to do, deal with it as we go. Okay, well, hopefully we'll see you, see you soon. All right, gang, we'll look forward to um, the um, wines of the, of the uh, Great Dividing Range for next week. So I um, hope to see you all then. Um, if you've got a question or comment, just drop me an email and um, um, we'll have later this week published the themes for September and, um, and getting the wine and so on. So hopefully you can uh, take part. So see you all, see you all next. Thanks, Ken, and thanks, Frederick, for the, for the wines and the recipes. <laughs> good luck. Thanks, guys. Good luck for this week, everyone. Yeah, good luck, absolutely, for everybody. <laughs> see you. Yeah.